Hello, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and to see all of you in the audience. And before I say anything, I just want to say I was blown away by those four presentations. <laughs> Particularly the two 17 years old. I, I, that was wonderful, both of you, to have the courage to do that and do it so eloquently and articulately. You cannot underestimate how powerful that is, and you've both got fantastic careers ahead of you. And the same for the... Um, the Launchpad students who I've met before. I mean, I was impressed when I came to your um, celebration the other day, but I'm even more impressed now. And it's funny, Clive, that you mentioned something about Slaughter and May, because I remember when they... I've been in the city a long time, and I remember when they first opened their offices with the waterfall. And, it, <laughs> and those of you who don't know it, the waterfall looks a bit like black marble. And I've, it's a bit of an apocryphal story, but I'm going to tell you anyway, seeing as I'm at Allen and Overy. Um, <laughs> that um, on, the, on, on the first day it opened, the, some Slaughter and May partners went in, didn't realise it was a waterfall because it looked like marble and walked straight through it. <laughs> and the word that went around was, that just goes to prove Slaughter and May partners think they can walk on water. <laughs> um, as I said, I'm delighted to see all of you here tonight. Before I get on to introducing Baroness Scotland, um, I just want to welcome some candidates who are here tonight from the International Lawyers for Africa. I'm a director on that programme. And we've got some lawyers who've come from a number of African countries, including Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Cameroon, and um, Ghana as well. I'm from Nigeria, so there's a real thing about Ghana and Nigeria. So. <laughs> Um, and I would like it if they could just stand up in the room, the Ilfa students, so we can uh, just welcome them. Um, they are spending um, three months um, with a number of uh, city law firms here, um, and uh, they're on a very... Um, organised programme where they're learning, they're getting to know the law firms, they're learning about British law. They're also learning a lot about football, as I've heard, and one of them has managed to score three Chelsea tickets in the time that she's here, so it just goes to show. Um, I'm here to introduce Baroness Scotland, our Attorney General, and I thought, what do I say about someone who doesn't actually need an introduction? Um, that's tough. We all know about the stellar career that Baroness Scotland has had. It's been mentioned tonight, the fact that she was the, young, the youngest ever um, black female um, QC at 35. I mean, at 35, that is absolutely extraordinary. That is a real wow. Um, the fact that William Pitt the Younger, so many years before her, was the other one is also quite extraordinary when you think how different characters they... I don't think he was from Walthamstow. <laughs> <laughs> and he was 21 and only got it because he was Prime Minister. <laughs> I think that's cheating, don't you? <laughs> um, she's also been appointed the House of Lords and the Privy Council. And of course we know that she is the first... Um, black female Attorney General, and indeed the first female Attorney General in 700, not 500, 700 <laughs> years. We lost 200 years somewhere, <laughs> but we found them again. But we all know that. I just wanted to say a bit about my personal experience with Baroness Scotland. She is a total inspiration to me. I've met her on a number of occasions, and from the first time I met her, I was in quite in awe that I was going to be in the same room um, as the Attorney General, because not only essentially is she my boss in a very big way, but um, because of her stellar career. But I found her to be an inspiration because she was approachable. She was down to earth. She was always herself and she was passionate about justice and the job that she did. She really is a role model for all of us. I'm not going to say any more. I give you Baroness yeah. Scotland, our Attorney General. Firstly, can I say thank you for that very kind introduction. But I think if we're talking about inspiration, then the people we've heard from this evening are really my inspiration. I was so sad not to be here to hear the whole of Ray's 
interview. And you're very lucky because we have on this platform one of the greatest, greatest contributors to justice in our country. And it was a real pleasure to hear him answer the questions that were so well put to him in his usual frank, engaging, charming way. You can really see why, once upon a time, he was a taxi driver. <laughs> but I really would like to thank Debo for inviting me to speak at this launch, but also thank her for all the extraordinary work she has done to inspire such talent in the young people that she has been blessed to help. This launch of Black Letter Law 2009 is quite an exceptional opportunity for all of us. You've already heard Ray talk about the past and what that was like. And from Trevor, you've heard more about the present and a little perhaps about the future. And from the students studying the aspiring careers, the glittering careers that they're going to have. And I really want to thank them for being prepared to start this journey and for all the things that they will achieve in the future. And I want to remind them that they are going to be responsible for paying our pensions <laughs> when we are old. So the investment that Debo and others are having has a little bit of self-interest. <laughs> um, I have to also tell you that um, Trevor and I seem to share something, because I too worked for Sainsbury's. <laughs> However, I lasted far longer than he. I lasted for two years, and I was allowed to work on the till. <laughs> I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, in those days, you had to use mental arithmetic <laughs> and not a machine. And um, I was told by my uh, teachers at that stage in Walthamstow that if I worked really, really hard and applied myself and concentrated, I might, I might aspire one day, and I want you to savor this moment, to be a supervisor. <laughs> so I'm afraid I've disappointed David Sainsbury. <laughs> And I was uh, privileged to tell him that I don't think he can afford me anymore. Uh, and I also should have been a tax lawyer, because I was invited to be a tax pupil. And I have to tell you um, that I didn't find it quite as alluring. <laughs> And it was academically stimulating and challenging, but I have this funny fascination with people. <laughs> so I really congratulate Trevor, I celebrate his success, and I'm glad it's him. <laughs> but I've been asked to draw some of the themes together, because we've had the past, we've had the present, and we've had a bit of the future. And it seems to me that the past, present, and future is very much at the heart of Black History Month. And we're here today in part to celebrate Black History Month. And I've been given the task to draw the themes, and I'm very willing to be your brief, Debo, on this occasion. And during Black History Month, it's inevitable that we consider our past. History is in the title and therefore I think it must be in our minds as well. 
But there is an etymological issue to be resolved really at the very outset. What do we mean when we say history? And what do we take from it? Can we turn the concept of history on its head and, and claim that it is not behind us? Sometimes we're told we make history. Ray has done it. Trevor has done it. And I really believe that the young people we see before us will do it. So which implies, I suppose, that history is taking place around us before the present glides into the past. And it might even be arguable that history is in the future. It is simply that we don't know which part of our future will be remembered when it has finally taken place. Even if we do, for argument's sake, place history firmly in the past and put a secure pin in it, the debate moves on to focus on what history means and what we should learn from it. Some people believe that history is clearly defined. It has a beginning and an end. And we can see the entirety of it because it is over and it has ceased to exist. And the novel Go Between, which was written by L.P. Hartley, is often considered the most famous for its opening line. It is a line that we often recall imperfectly, perhaps proving the very point it makes. But it reads thus, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Is history then, uh, while interesting to us, a world unknown, a place to which we cannot return? Does it have an influence limited to the lessons that we've learned from it? Now, others believe that our history defines us, that there is no step we take in the present that has not been shaped in some way by all that has gone before us, by our parents and by our grandparents, and their grandparents before them. And our shoes carry the dust of all the previous pathways taken, including those taken by previous generations. So the dust that's been left by Ray will be picked up on all our shoes. And we carry the imprint of history with us in every step we take in the present. And we, ca and we will carry it, I believe, into the future. And history, therefore, has a relevance beyond the historic. And I believe that when I walk, I carry the experiences of my parents and my grandparents before them. And I carry all that history with me. They are what has made me possible. And it is their history that is added to my own. And this is what each of us will hand on to successive generations. And it is this that I think about during Black History Month. This month, we must consider the experiences of our parents and those who went before us. My parents brought my brothers and sisters and brought me to this country in 1957 to live in London. Now, 1957 was before any of you were born. And in the 1950s and 1960s, Families like mine came from uh, the Caribbean to the United Kingdom to settle, were establishing themselves. And at that stage, I was one of my parents' 10 only children. 
because my parents used to say they only had one of each of us. <laughs> and the response to families such as mine could be uncertain and suspicious. Attitudes were sometimes graphic, and I think Ray might have reminded us a bit of that. Things said or shouted, slogans on walls, all serving as a powerful reminder that these new families to the United Kingdom were generating, sometimes by their mere presence, conflict, not contentment, rejection, not acceptance. And I was very fortunate because as the memories I carry with me from that time are the support and the cherishing I received from my family. So when we were told, take the mentoring from wherever you can get it, I would really endorse that. My father in particular taught me that I could do anything I wanted as long as it was what I really wanted to be and as long as I worked hard enough for it. He said, you have a talent. Each one of us has a talent. Each one in this room has a talent. We have to find it, hone it, and then use it for the benefit of other people. And his expectations were really frustrating at times, as it meant that I didn't really have any excuses for not achieving that which I set out to do. And that can be really unsettling, especially if you're a child of five or six. I remember the first time I asked my father about something, I said something was terrible and it had to change. I was six years old and he agreed with me, it was awful. And then he asked me this, now what are you going to do about it? And I thought, I'm six! <laughs> But it was something that I didn't forget. And I carry with me my past as a gift from my parents, and a gift that I believe is vital that we all receive if we are to grow into our true potential. I was given both the opportunity and the responsibility to shape my own future. If I wanted to be a lawyer, which I did, then so far as my parents were concerned, this was perfectly possible. Indeed, once I had announced to my family that I was going to be a lawyer, it became an expectation in our household, one that I dare not let them down. And I have to tell you that um, you've been very kindly dealt with this evening, because you were told, get a 2-1 or get a first. My father was never as kind. I remember once my brother got 98% in his Latin, and my father asked him what happened to the other 2%. <laughs> now, in becoming a lawyer, I have my brothers and my sisters to thank, because despite their own experiences, of a country that was uncertain about where and how well they fitted in. They never once suggested that the fact that I was black or a woman would deny me the opportunity to become a barrister. My family simply loved me for who I was and demanded that I be the best that I could be and that I should be of service to others and give, and they gave me their whole support, all the support they could muster. And their belief in me allowed me, for example, to disagree with my careers advisor. And I've told you the aspirations they had for me and I failed utterly. My family's faith in me let me know that what I wanted was actually the most important thing. And therefore, the choice was my decision. I was going to be the final arbiter of what I did and didn't do. And it goes without saying 
that without that, without that absolute belief, I might have been swayed by an assessment made by those who knew very little of my hopes, very little of my aspirations, or my latent ability, and nothing at all about my belief in God. And in 1966, Senator Robert F. Kennedy spoke to the young people of South Africa on their day of affirmation. And he said this, he said, few will have the greatness to bend history itself. But each of us can work to change a small portion of events. And in the total of all those events will be written the history of this generation. And I may disagree with Robert Kennedy about whether or not my parents bent my history and that of my brothers and sisters. Personally, I believe they did. But there can, however, be no doubt that they worked to change events for me. And in this, they wrote my future history as a barrister, as a silk, and finally, as Attorney General. And it seemed to me that Kennedy's quote can be set at the very heart of Black History Month. We might quail at the thought that we are required to bend history, because it sounds arduous and long and frustrating. But it is, however, something that has already been happening in what my parents and previous generations have done, in what Ray has done, in what Debo is doing now, and in what each of us must do, and I hope will do, in the future, because we must go on to do this. And what we think of as small changes have a power to write history as much as the large changes do. And as Kennedy said, it's the totality of these changes that will make the difference. The launch of the 2009 edition of Black Letter, Letter Law tonight allows us to focus on the legal profession and the history that has already been made and shaped, as well as the history that we are making now, tonight, and in the future. We see this, in fact, in what the black letter law has already done. It's now well established. Uh, it's a fixture in the annual legal calendar. Yet it was only launched in 2006. And that which was once novel and unexpected is now habitual. And the move towards noting, acknowledging, and celebrating the contributions of black and ethnic minority lawyers is crucial. It is crucial because, as the publication says, we have the opportunity to showcase achievement in law. And all of the lawyers featured in this year's publication have widened the legal profession, introducing a marvelous diversity, a breadth of focus, a breadth of fresh air, some would say, that was very much needed. And the past lawyers who feature in black letter law help to inspire the present diversity of lawyers. And we need to celebrate and thank all of them. The present lawyers who feature in black letter law and the people here tonight, I think, will inspire future generations of diverse lawyers. The young people inspired even old fogies like me. And we are, I think, incredibly proud of each and every one of you and your achievement. The more visible diversity is in the legal profession, the more it safeguards a future legal profession that is rooted in excellence, rich in diversity, and proudly so. As members of this old and ancient talented profession, 
We are bending history and helping to make the change of which Kennedy spoke. And we have moved from a time when ethnicity was seen as a reason not to be taken on as opposed to where we are now. We now occupy a time when professions are own included, welcome talent and skill irrespective of a person's background or how they look. And I mentioned at the outset that some people believe history is what we make in the future. And during Black History Month, I believe it's important that we contemplate what future we are making for ourselves and for our profession. We can inspire future generations who presently do not even know what law is, never mind whether it's a career path that they choose for themselves. And I am humbled to share my profession with lawyers and judges who inspire me by their passion, their commitment to justice, and their beliefs. They believe that law is built on merit, out of lawyers who are chosen because of their talent, not their background or their appearance. Though I have to tell you, the lawyers here tonight look pretty attractive to me. <laughs> and I believe that this faith in talent, however it is packaged, and in teaching young people to have aspirations and to feel empowered to live up to those aspirations will be absolutely critical. It's a gift we can share with our young people. It's our way to help write the history for their future generations. And in concluding, I'd like, if I may, just to return to Robert F. Kennedy's speech to the people of South Africa in 1966. And Kennedy said, our future may lie beyond our vision, but it is not completely beyond our control. It is the shaping impulse of America that neither fate nor nature nor the irresistible tides of history, but the work of our own hands matched to reason and principle that will determine our destiny. Neither fate nor nature nor the irresistible tides of history will determine the future of the legal profession. History is the work of our hands. Black History Month provides us with an opportunity to make future history, to make it with reason and with principle. If we seize that opportunity, we will leave the finest legacy for future generations. I am incredibly proud to be your Attorney General, incredibly proud to be the leader of this profession, but the proudest thing of all is that I am incredibly proud of all of you. Thank you very much.